Hi, today we'll talk about women's history from 1915 to the present. And the theme of this discussion is that new opportunities opened up for women historians uh, in the post-war era, uh, which dramatically transformed uh, the nature of the, of the profession. Uh, keeping in mind that before the Second World War, it was exceedingly difficult uh, for most women to get a position uh, teaching or writing about history. Uh, professional historians were overwhelmingly men, and they sought to, as to assert that position uh, well up to the war and afterwards. One of the few exceptions that we know of was Mary Ritter Beard, who was a labor historian who also wrote on women's work and political rights. And in part, this grew out of a strong interest in the rights of workers as an investigation into injustice and exploitation. And she was inspired by ideals of social and economic justice, and she supported the suffrage movement for women. And she came of age in which the vote for women was one of the dominant themes of the progressive era. Uh, one of the key figures in her life was her husband, Charles Beard, uh, who became a political um, and a scientist and an historian. Uh, they met at DePaul University. They went to um, England. And there they both witnessed um, um, or were exposed to, to Marxist economics, uh, to the, the, the problems of urban and industrial life, and they wanted to, uh, to present a, a new side to the, the working class and to present some of their uh, problems and frustrations. In other words, to look for a different kind of history than many were writing before. And when they came back, to England, each in their own ways, and sometimes together, uh, they created histories that were, in some ways, radically different than from what people had seen uh, in the past. The approach for Mary Ritter Beard is that uh, women have always been a force in history, as she put it, whether as intellectuals, as wives, uh, as officials as uh, activists in the local government uh, and institutions. And yet, even though uh, many women had shared power or been exceedingly influential, they, except for very few exceptions, they rarely turned up in the history books, which were overwhelmingly written by men. And so she argued women's role has been largely obscured uh, and shunted to the side. Um, effectively, men uh, writing largely military and political histories up to that point, which uh, left uh, most women out of these histories. And so she combined her interest in writing women's history with her interest in political activism. Uh, and so she wrote a series of books that uh, took these ideas into consideration. Uh, one of these is A Woman's Work in Municipalities, which came out at the height of the Progressive Era in 1915. She went through documents of hundreds of local organizations and societies. And her goal was to see work that women did to improve the lives in American cities and towns. And she looked at documents from women's clubs and political groups that sought to get the vote. And she found a wealth of materials uh, about women and their effort to reform uh, government, to reform uh, local institutions, the kinds of documents that had simply been ignored in the past. So she wanted to get women's views in their own words and not simply uh, those of men. Another work she wrote was the short history of the American labor movement, in which she looked at both men and women, uh, and from revolutionary times to the present. Uh, it was um, quite a large uh, survey text that came out in 1920, 
and she argued that the labor movement really began in self-defense, the efforts by workers to protect themselves from uh, exploitation and abuse that they had witnessed during the Industrial Revolution. And this is really a work of early social history, um, influenced by uh, Marxist ideas, uh, this interest in the common people, uh, men, women, children, their struggles and their hardships. And she wrote, the story of the labor movement cannot be told in headlines, but is a chronicle of steady and patient organization and moderate legislation. And uh, a third major work that she wrote was America Through Women's Eyes, which she published at the onset of the Great Depression. And this was a further effort to counter the trend of many labor historians, a relatively a young field at that time, uh, which solely included uh, histories of men. And so she looked at women in the labor force since the 17th century, uh, the challenges, the gains, their roles in society and in industry, and to look well beyond women's traditional roles as a homemaker or as a caregiver, where they typically tended to appear uh, in, in men's histories. And so she to, to research this book, she edited um, a, a trove of documents, letters, treatises, essays on women's personal experience, uh, African American women as well as white women. And she referred to women as activists and thinkers who emphasized agency or action rather than merely passive contributions. Um, and to quote one part of her text, uh, women's efforts uh, resulted in the place of women in the evaluation of society, in activities and thoughts, and these will of necessity receive a new and more realistic treatment. And in part, this is a reaction to the time period in which she was writing it, the Great Depression. With the crash of 1929, she wrote, working in what had been a man's world, in which women had secured a foothold uh, became more of a nightmare uh, for millions of working women because uh, women were frequently um, dismissed before uh, men. And she wanted to get these words and these actions down on paper and in her histories. She made further efforts in women's history one of these included the co-founding of the World Center for Women's Archives, or WCWA, in 1935, which she co-founded with peace activist Rosika Schwimmer, who was an immigrant from Hungary. And their goal was to collect as many documents related to women's history as possible um, and, and from women all over the world. And their purpose was to write about women in a variety of different roles, um, as intellectuals, as activists, as workers in industry, as well as as homemakers. And they took the motto of no documents, no history. So one of the challenges that women historians faced at the time was just trying to get a hold of the documents and the goal of their archive was to try to solve that problem, to collect a group of documents together and thereby provide a foundation for women's history. Uh, the archive did not last. Uh, it broke up during the Second World War. Uh, but the papers went to uh, Radcliffe College and, and Smith College, uh, as well as the New Jersey Historical Society. So uh, in that sense, um, the, their work continued to live on in these archives. And also, um, Mary Ritter Beard uh, was exceedingly unusual in co-publishing a series of works with her husband, Charles Beard. They wrote uh, several American histories together. Uh, and these included The Rise of American Civilization, a two-volume work, uh, and uh, the Basic History of the United States, which came out during the Second World War, uh, which 
aimed for a broad historical synthesis across American history, which included the efforts of all people in the country, um, and not just a select few uh, white males. Uh, and in that sense, they wanted to uh, transform the nature of the profession itself. And now I'd like to talk about the concept of gender and then turn to the work of several women historians, uh, Joan Wallach Scott, Mary Simone Davis, and Vicki Rees. Uh, gender is a concept that inspired many women and men to think about women's history in a new light. And it came in part out of the work of author Betty Friedan, a sociologist who wrote a landmark work in 1963 called The Feminine Mystique. And she asked the question, when did women decide to give up the world and go back home? Uh, she looked at the role of women in industrial societies, and she was in part influenced, as Mary Ritter Beard, by Marxist and socialist um, viewpoints and the exploitation of workers. And she said this um, position of women who had jobs um, during the war were suddenly uh, told to give them up and when men came back home from the war and basically to assert the role of, of homemakers and that many women found themselves deeply uh, dissatisfied with this way of life and she asked the question how did that happen and is there more uh, for women in this society beyond simply the traditional role of homemaker and her answer was decidedly yes and building on the work of uh, Mary Ritter Beard uh, inspired uh, by the work of, of Betty Frieden more and more women uh, began to uh, come into the professional field of history to attend graduate programs during the 1960s and 70s and ultimately uh, to take on professorial positions and administrators and they tried to reverse this long-standing trend in uh, historiography that effectively ignored the contributions and efforts of, uh, of many women um, and to show that women could take an active role in events and not simply the passive viewpoints that, uh, that men tended to place them in, in their histories. And it grew alongside a very influential movement uh, in American and European historiography of social and cultural history, which sought to be uh, far more inclusive than the previous emphasis on political and military history. And to this concept of gender, the historian Joan Wallach Scott uh, had a decided contribution. She was an American uh, historian of, of French and intellectual history, and she looked at the term of gender, how the roles of men and women evolved over time, but that the concept of gender is really a construction of the society in which it takes place. And she argued this point in a landmark article called Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis, which came out in the leading historical journal uh, in the United States, the American Historical Review, in the mid-1980s. And uh, this work came to become the most cited article uh, in, up to that point of um, uh, publications, articles by the American Historical Review. And it greatly encouraged uh, work in women's history, but also to uh, simply understand how gender influenced people's work and influenced society. That it had varied meaning and that it could change over time. That different societies viewed the gender differently um, based on the privileges or not that it allowed. Uh, and that it could uh, evolve um, based on its construction within society. Uh, and to return to the point, um, um, she argued that uh, 
many women or had been left out of traditional uh, men's histories, that there was a very traditional view of gender in these uh, histories that men wrote, and that we need to rethink uh, this concept and to look at how uh, women's roles and men's roles evolved over time, that they were not simply static and how many historians tended to view um, women's roles. And she then can, began to publish a series of books um, mainly on France, French um, intellectual history, labor history, women's history. Uh, and in that sense, barring on some of the uh, approaches of Mary Ritter Beard um, and uh, looking at um, uh, um, the glass workers of Carmo, which came out in 1974, how craftsmen and women had took political action in 19th century France. She published a work called Women, Work, and Family, which she co-authored with fellow historian Louise Tilly, uh, and then published a series of other works, Gender and the Politics of History, and others. And in this sense, uh, presented an, um, an entirely new approach uh, to the study of history. Um, she got her degrees at the University of Wisconsin and, and began teaching at Northwestern and finally joined Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study as, uh, uh, as professor. Uh, and with this foundation and this changing notion of gender, um, we find uh, two other historians who um, made their mark. Uh, Natalie Simone Davis and Vicki Reese. Uh, Natalie Simone Davis, uh, like uh, Genoise Scott, was an historian of French social and cultural history. Uh, she was educated at Smith College in Radcliffe, got her PhD at the University of, Mi of Michigan, and then began taking on a series of professorial positions when very few women were part of the academy. Uh, she taught at Brown University, at the University of Toronto, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, and then finally Princeton, um, like Joan Wallace Scott. And her main interest, in her words, uh, was to show how individuals shape themselves in relation to larger structures. So she saw people as actors maneuvering to cope with their conditions. And, that, uh, and the choices, and exceedingly few choices that many women had in early modern France. And in this, she was heavily influenced by French social historians and uh, English historians, um, French historians uh, like, like Marc Bloch, uh, and English historians like uh, E.P. Thompson. And she sought to, as she put it, reconstruct ordinary lives in the context of larger social themes of behavior. And her main interests were religious dissent, ritual, uh, and carnivals, and riots. One of her leading works was uh, Society and Culture in Early Modern France which came out in 1975, which was a collection of her essays. And this work uh, proved influential far beyond the field of just early modern France. Indeed, social and cultural historians, this growing field, saw her work as an inspiration for new avenues of thought, of new areas that they could go down, in which people lived within kinship networks, and where anthropology, the discipline of anthropology, could be very useful in trying to determine these ties and connections, which set up a whole sub-area of history in which historians are drawing on other fields, in this case anthropology, to try to understand how these communities, many of whom could not read or write, um, established means of, of survival, how they express themselves through various rituals and traditions, uh, and how the kinds of connections that they had from women and men. Uh, to this end, 
uh, she wrote a, a book called The Return of Martin Gare, which is perhaps her quintessential look uh, at peasant life and customs and how they shaped uh, peasant experience. And she asked the question of how a peasant woman, uh, whose name was Bertrand de Rolls, it's a true story, uh, could survive in very trying circumstances in which her husband left her and her farm. And a man claiming to be Martin Guerre um, returns. And she accepts him in uh, based on the few choices that she had. Uh, and eventually this uh, um, fraud is uncovered. And uh, the figure whose name was Jean de Cora um, is eventually, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the figure is Arnold de Thiel, is eventually put to death. Um, and was Bertrand an imposter? Or did she seek a compromise in trying to seek uh, a kind of position of power in the village? Uh, how could an imposter um, fool so many people for so long? And the case developed a fascination after it uh, arose. Um, in the uh, 1540s and, and 50s during a time of enormous political and religious conflict in France. And this case study, or microhistory as we could call it, uh, was a means of illuminating the roles of women and men in a very troubled and difficult period in French history. And she wrote other texts that also had influence, fiction, in the archives of 16th century France, letters by criminals who were asking the king for pardons, or women on the margins, three 17th century lives, in which, uh, although on the margins, uh, these women had choices that they could make and thereby be agents uh, of, uh, of change within their societies rather than simply passive figures on a stage dominated by men. And these were women who were either successful businesswomen or had education or a stab or were in one case a nun and established themselves through their writings and their efforts as uh, examples of what some women could achieve during a period of enormous difficulty and struggle for many women. And then finally, Vicky Reese. Uh, Vicky Reese uh, is a labor, ethnic, and oral historian, currently works at the University of California in Irvine. And like all of these historians, she had an interest in women's work and the challenges that they faced. Uh, but her area uh, is in uh, Latin American history, specifically uh, of um, uh, many uh, Mexican immigrants to the United States who came of age in America and sought to have a place uh, in this society. Uh, she got her first degree from Florida State University and then attended Stanford University. And then she went to Guadalajara uh, to interview a labor activist who had worked in the United States. And her name was Luisa Moreno. And Luisa Moreno encouraged her to study cannery workers in Southern California. Uh, that this was an area in which no historians had ventured. Many of these cannery workers were women, uh, frequently uh, immigrants from Mexico or second generation, um, and uh, struggled in anonymity, um, and no one had told their story. And Professor Rees uh, saw this as an, uh, the, be the focus of her doctoral dissertation. And that book, uh, which went on to, to win several awards, uh, became known based on her dissertation, uh, Cannery Women, uh, Cannery Lives. And she came in a period in which uh, Chicano history was relatively new at universities. And she could also offer um, her work in, in women's history and in oral history. 
and with relatively few scholars to, to teach in these fields, uh, Vicky Reese became um, an interdisciplinarian, uh, drawing on different areas and fields to offer a new type of history. And she taught at several universities, the University of Texas at El Paso, University of California, Davis. She taught very close to here at uh, the Claremont Graduate University. And then finally ended up at the University of California, Irvine, where she became distinguished professor of history and for a while a dean at the School of Humanities. And she felt that one should take an involvement in history in a variety of levels. As she said, we don't have the luxury to stay in our offices and say, I'm an academic. That one should uh, take a stand on issues as public intellectuals. Uh, and from some of these ideas, she created uh, another major work in the field of American history uh, from out of the shadows, Mexican women in 20th century America. And this became a classic in social and labor history. As she wrote, uh, the reader should imagine what it was like to be a woman in the 1920s and 1930s, to recognize the opportunities available to Mexican women in the US, and very importantly, what was beyond their grasp. And so she relied very heavily on oral history. And oral history is a particular form in which you have to garner the trust of the person you're engaging in an interview to be able to, um, uh, to, to offer up new or uh, different kinds of insights, stories that perhaps had never been told before, certainly not in established histories. And so she uh, focused on what she called the ethics of consumption and the social construction of gender to look at different sources like La Pignon or uh, secondary literature and oral histories that uh, previous historians had never really resorted to. And so she draws on works of what many women felt at the time, their dreams, uh, what limitations they had, uh, and how they sought to overcome these limitations. As she said, in what ways did education and popular culture feed women's dreams? As an oral historian, I consider the process by which the past becomes memory and then memory becomes history. But for memory to become history, you have to capture those stories and put them on the printed page, stories that had largely been uh, ignored by many historians in the past. And so, like Mary Ritter Beard, like uh, Natalie Zamon Davis and others, she becomes an interdisciplinary historian drawing on a variety of different fields in an era when social and cultural history are coming of age, in which Chicano studies are coming of age, and enables her to write then a series of texts to tell that story. Women on the U.S.-Mexico border, responses to change. Another work, Unequal Sisters, a multicultural reader in U.S. women's history, which is now in its fourth edition. And uh, more recently, Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia, which consists of case studies of Latinas who achieved prominence in their careers and writing about women who, in the historical record, had previously been either ignored or misrepresented. And part of the effort for Vicki Reese and many others is to try to represent those presentations, to find stories that had not really been talked about before, and so to write a more complete history of the past. <laughs>